Welcome to The Technology Pill, a podcast that looks at how technology is reshaping our lives every day and exploring the different ways that governments and companies use tech to increase their power. My name's Caitlin and I'm PI's Senior Campaigns Officer. Hi! This week we're discussing PI's work on data in elections. As I'm sure you can imagine, in much the same way technology has spread into so many corners of our lives, data and technology have become increasingly important in elections. PI has been working on data in elections for a number of years, work that last year culminated in two of our colleagues joining an expert mission observing election technology used in the Kenyan election. Kenya's history with elections hasn't always been smooth. In 2017, the last presidential election, the process was marred by human rights abuses, including unlawful killings by police, violence and claims of fraud and hacking. The election result was ultimately nullified by Kenya's Supreme Court, The court didn't say the fraud had occurred, but did point out irregularities that had affected the integrity of the election, and the election was rerun, though second time round, Raila Odinga didn't participate and urged a boycott. We're about to join Laura and Lucy in the back of a taxi in the run-up to the 2022 Kenyan presidential elections, and then we'll talk to Lucy and Laura to find out more about data in elections generally. A lot of traffic today, we're not so lucky. And it's, it's, it is a very busy place. Yeah, you're, you mean it. <laughs> okay, Alfred, tell me again what you think about the elections this year. Uh, this way around, the election will be performed well, very nicely because people are well equipped and they are informed about the election. They have experience of the last event election, 2017, so they have that experience, they cannot repeat it again. People are well informed about the election and they are ready to vote. They are well prepared. Yeah, yeah. And you were saying that people just want to vote and go home. They don't yeah, want any trouble. This way around, because people have that experience of last year election, they are ready now to vote and go home. So you don't think there'll be any trouble? They couldn't interfere in trouble at all. Thank you so much. Thank you for that tour. That was amazing. Hi, my name is Lucy Purden. I am Policy Director at Privacy International, and I also lead our project Protecting the Election Cycle which focuses on supporting election observers to incorporate issues of privacy and data protection that arise from the use of election technology into their methodology. Hi, everyone. My name is Laura Lazaro Cabrera, and I am a legal officer at Privacy International, and I've worked on data and elections for three years, as well as supporting the Protecting the Election Cycle project. Okay, so you've both been working on elections for a while. Lots of organisations look at elections, they look at fake news, there's been a lot of conversations about disinformation, but how did all of the elections kind of work start for PI? So at PI, we've been dancing around the issue of elections for quite some time. It touches on so much of our work, not only for PI, but also the partners we work with around the world. So since 2016, we've been working on issues of cybersecurity and investigating more and more data breaches around the world. And we were seeing a lot of these data breaches were in connection with voter registers, massive data breaches in the Philippines and Mexico. And alongside that, people being sent unsolicited political messages, text message in Kenya. But really where it kind of came together for us was in 2016, we started investigating a little known company called Cambridge Analytica. And this was in the context of the Kenyan elections in 2017. We understood that Cambridge Analytica were involved in some way in political campaigning in Kenya. And this really concerned us because the kind of data analytics and profiling that a company like Cambridge Analytica did was very opaque and also extremely risky in a country like Kenya. At the time, Kenya had no data protection law, but also elections are historically extremely tense and there is a history of post-election violence. So we wanted to know what Cambridge Analytica was doing, with who, what kind of data was being collected and what it was being used for. And we kind of followed the data a little bit in terms of some of the campaigning videos 
that were around. But really, it was so difficult to investigate. But we knew there was a problem. We had enough to know that there was a problem. And we published quite a bit of work around that. Now, when the Cambridge Analytica scandal blew up in 2018 in the context of Facebook, we were able to then come out and say, look, this is the tip of the iceberg. You know, there are hundreds of companies like Cambridge Analytica. And so we were able to come into the debate from that angle and kind of expose the fact that there was this whole industry built up around elections that was incredibly difficult to investigate because it was so opaque. You know, political parties, the way they do online campaigning is not transparent. They are relying on these third party companies that makes them one step removed from political parties. So it's very difficult to hold them to account. And particularly in Kenya, this issue really blew up. Our partners were very interested. The public were very, very interested. And so while in in Europe and the US, this was a kind of a, a Cambridge Analytica Facebook scandal, in the rest of the world, it was kind of pivoting towards why is there no data protection in these countries and how data protection relates to political campaignings. So really, to sum up, like our work on elections eventually came together under this banner of preventing data exploitation in the election cycle. So the reason we decided to do this podcast is you guys have come back not that long ago from an election observation mission in Kenya. Why did the work go from investigating these specific data exploitation instances, these specific companies? How does that become work looking at election observers. So all of this work that I've described that, you know, we were undertaking, what this was building up to is an understanding that elections are very data driven. And in terms of the work of election observers, you know, election observers are a group of international organizations or regional or local that are invited by the government that's having an election to come in and observe the electoral processes. And they then reproduce reports with recommendation to the government about how to improve these processes. But when it comes to observing these very complex technical applications in regards to elections, this is very difficult to observe. So we saw a need here. And we also saw that election observers had a really good standing, quite a lot of leverage, and but they also needed support in kind of how they could incorporate observation of technology into their methodology. So this is why we decided to enter the space in terms of election observers. Now, when we started this project four years ago, we didn't know anyone in this space at all, but we thought that the background that PI has and the expertise could be useful for observers going forward. You know, increasingly, they're called upon to consider this role of personal data and technologies used by all the main actors in democratic elections. And this is really not an easy task. It's fast moving. It's developing all the time. So this is why we decided to enter the space. Also, if you remember going back four years, when you thought about elections, everything was about fake news and disinformation. You know, it was really kind of sucking all the air out of the room. But from all the work that we'd done, we knew there was many different angles to this and many different facets. So at PI, we're interested in what's behind the curtain. So what data has been collected and inferred about you that has resulted in you seeing this piece of content, you know, the fake news or the disinformation. And also looking at the companies that make this their business model to kind of develop a lot of these campaigning tools, they need to be exposed and scrutinized as do the political parties. And then of course, you're bringing in the work that we've done on voter registration and data collection around those areas as well. So this is why it came under the banner of data exploitation in the election cycle. I'd like to say something about that as well. There are two really important things about election observers that I wasn't personally aware of until I started doing this work, but two key things that they have and that we may not necessarily have, not generally as PI, but as a civil society organization is access and also reach. So election observers, as we've come to learn, and specifically international ones, so the ones that have a big profile, will participate in a number of elections in any given year, have a really good access to key individuals and entities that are involved in the electoral process. And that access is virtually unrivaled from the civil society side. So say, for instance, if a civil society organization not traditionally involved in electoral observation, try to get in with these actors, try to talk to them, it would be really difficult to even get an appointment or get an interview with them. However, these international observers have really good access that they can also share 
with other people. And so for us coming in with them was really important to be able to access information that we traditionally would have never even seen or heard of until much, much later. And that is a, an obstacle for many NGOs, not just us. Access to information is always a big challenge. And tied to the question of access is also the influence that electoral observers have. So always national authorities will want to put their best foot forward. They want to show international observers that they're doing a good job of managing the election. And that means having really, really good information from them as to what's gone well and also what's not gone so well. There's also the huge benefit of reach. Electoral observers can develop tools and standards that they can deploy in a range of different elections, which makes them ideal for testing new tools, specifically when it comes to assessing how data protection and privacy are considered in the election cycle. And they can test these tools in a range of different places. So we get to see a much broader range of results and we get to learn a lot more. So it makes sense why PI would want to work with election observers. How have you guys been approaching that work and how has it been for you over the past four years? So there was a lot of issues in connection with elections that were very much in PI's wheelhouse. You know, we've spoken about online campaigning, but also much broader than that, the issues with data collection and voter registration, especially when you come to biometric voter registration and the future of election technology, which provides new challenges and complexities. So we felt like we had a quite a lot to share, but it was a huge learning curve for us working with election observers for the first time because they work in a very different way to the way PI would work or civil society. You know, they have these very strict methodologies. They have these international standards. And this was all incredibly new to us as an organization. So we had to really get on board and, and understand where they were coming from and what they were working with in order to find the best way to help them and support them. So as we became more familiar with the election cycle and observer methodology, we developed a checklist for observers. And this kind of follows the methods that observers use when they are on mission. So it's a series of questions that could be asked of relevant parties with also some policy recommendations and other questions and answers that might be useful. And our checklist identifies the main areas where technology and the processing of personal data play a key role in the electoral process. So firstly, it covers the overarching legal framework relating to the administration of elections. So that covers voter registration, voting, and the role of the electoral management bodies. And then the second part is the regulation of political parties and other political actors. So that includes financing and political campaigns. And then the third part is the role of private companies, notably search engines and social media platforms in the context of elections. So a particular focus on transparency and political advertising. So really even laying it out like this, like this is the election cycle and you can just see how much that data is just such a crucial part of elections now and the job that election observers have in order to cover all these bases is massive. And we just felt like there was a need for us to step in and share our expertise with as many organizations as possible and kind of grow the network that way. And this has really served as our baseline in the work that we've gone on to do with observers. This is kind of the calling card that we used in any of our initial kind of engagements. You know, the first couple of years was very much about us learning how observers worked and so the best way that we could support. And then we became very interested in actually going on a mission and actually being on the ground and learning from observers that way. Something that has been a challenge for us historically is the fact that privacy or data protection as concepts don't come naturally to election observer missions. And two concepts that we've seen sometimes be presented as being at odds with, with each other is the concept of voter participation and then the concept of data protection. And that is something that we've come across recently. So many actors acting in good faith will see data collection as being necessary in order to ensure that people receive the information that they need to go vote. And often authorities will want to collect extra information about voters or potential voters, for example, ethnicity or other personal characteristics, so that they can get a snapshot of who's not showing up at the polling station on voting day and election day, so that they can develop targeted policy solutions to make sure that they encourage everyone, every sector in society to go vote. And something that we've had to clarify in the past is that 
voter participation and data protection aren't at all at odds with each other. There is no tension there. All we say about that is that you can collect the data that is necessary to carry out an election. However, if you don't need the data, just give the people the option not to provide it. That's it. That's always been our starting point. And we're happy to see that concepts about data protection and privacy are sinking in with international election observers. Okay, so you both went on a mission, I guess is the correct language, to observe an actual election in Kenya. How was that and how did you end up kind of going? (laughs) Yeah, so the reason we wanted to go to Kenya is because Kenya is one of the most data-driven elections we've ever seen. They utilize a lot of technology in their electoral processes. And this goes back quite a long way from using text messages to send political messages up to social media and biometric voter registration and results transmission and beyond. And PI's got a lot of history working in Kenya. We have great partners there. We've been involved in, you know, a lot of the legislation developments that have happened recently. And it's always a pleasure to have anything to do with Kenya. The way that this came about is through a collaboration with the Carter Center, which is a U.S. NGO that works on democracy broadly, but they also do a lot of international election observation missions. We've been collaborating with them for a couple of years on these issues and how to incorporate these questions about data protection and technology into the methodology. And they very kindly invited us to go on a pre-election assessment This was observing the pre-election period. So we weren't there over election day or afterwards we were there in the run-up to the election. And what the Carter Centre did was send something called an election expert mission. So it was a small team and it was completely focused on election technology. It wasn't observing the wider electoral processes like turning up at the polling stations, which a full election observation mission would do. This was very tailored towards the election technology aspect. So it was very much an opportunity that we jumped at This was a very interesting moment to be going to Kenya to do an electoral observation there because this was the first ever election in Kenya to have a data protection law in place and in force. And at Privacy International, we were involved in submitting comments on the data protection law before it came into law, what was a bill, and even after. So we had followed this process quite closely. We knew the law quite well, and we were very keen to see it in action at such a crucial moment for Kenya's democracy. So this was a key opportunity to test, really, how the obligations set out under the data protection law were being complied with or enforced in the electoral context. And also was interesting for us from a broader perspective, as the Kenyan Data Protection Agency is fairly new. But despite that, at the time with the the pre-election assessment, it had already issued some guidance asserting the obligations of all actors in the elections ecosystem to comply with data protection law. So this was an ideal opportunity for us to see how the legislation was shaping up the electoral process and also to be able to draw some preliminary conclusions about what that meant for privacy and data protection. So you both said the working with election observers was a big change and was a big learning curve. But what did that look like, particularly once you were in Kenya? Like, what were the bigger challenges. How did it work, I guess? I think one of the big challenges for us and in terms of how observers work and how we work is uh, understanding that everything that election observers do is married back to electoral law and reference to international standards. So all of the recommendations that election observers make have to be referred back to an international standard. This is quite a well-traveled road when it comes down to electoral law or electoral processes because these standards have been in place for a long time. When it comes to international standards on the use of technology, this becomes a bit more tricky because this is an area of significant movement and evolution and things are being updated all the time. So as Laura said, you know, we were focusing here on the implementation of the Data Protection Act and what that meant for the elections. But when it comes to kind of referencing an international standard connected with that, well, there isn't an international standard of data protection. And, you know, more than once an observer said to me, well, can't we just reference the International Treaty on Data Protection? 
we thought, well, that would be wonderful if there is one, but th- but there isn't. So it becomes a little more challenging to support the recommendations that we were suggesting and tie them up with international standards that would be recognizable to election observers. Now, when it comes to the right to privacy, of course, that is very well established in treaties. And it's true in terms of international human rights treaties, of course, the main standard that relates to privacy and even data protection is the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And of course, this is such an important treaty when it comes to elections because privacy is such an enabling right and permits the enjoyment of other human rights, you know, the right to freedom of expression, the right to political participation, which of course is very relevant in the electoral context. And regionally, the right to privacy is enshrined in various other human rights instruments. And also what's sometimes forgotten is that the Council of Europe Convention 108 on the protection of personal data is a treaty with international reach that any states from any part of the world can accede or ratify. But then international human rights standards related to the application of technologies themselves, including in the context of elections, are constantly being developed. But there are lots of standards and resolutions to refer to. So you know, every year, every two years, sorry, there is the UN resolution on the right to privacy in the digital age that is constantly updated with evolving technologies. There's lots of guidelines that are coming out, especially from the Council of Europe. There is lots of data protection laws around the world. So all of these kind of non-treaty standards, they're providing a really authoritative interpretation of the obligations of states to respect and protect the right to privacy and other human rights during elections and political campaigns. It's just a case of you know, really digging into where they are and what they say, but they are very authoritative. And part of our role during this project has been to really highlight the scope of standards that there are that add up to these international principles that can absolutely be used in this context. The less glamorous side of things in terms of what that collaboration looked like uh, when we're in Kenya is that we were frantically running around Nairobi trying to make three to four different meetings a day, while at the same time trying to be sufficiently prepared to make sure that we were asking the right questions of the people that we only had an hour or 30 minutes to talk to, but also making sure that we had actual value add to provide in those meetings so that we knew the data protection legislation in Kenya through and through, but also that we were familiar with those broader standards in data protection and privacy that we want to see applied across the board. So it was a definitely very, very busy time for us. And it's incredible to see that this is what electoral observation missions look like for everyone who does them. So we were just given a snapshot of it, I think, by being there for just a week. But people do this for weeks on end, even months before an election and after. So the amount of work and effort that goes into these missions, I think, cannot be overstated. So they're not just people standing next to a voting booth with a clipboard looking serious. No, there's so much work that goes on behind the scenes. And not all of it is made public at the end of the day. The local civil society groups were so busy during this time. You know, there was so much work to do around observing elections and working on elections and ensuring that people have access to information or they know where the polling stations are or, you know, all of the support. And yet these incredible organizations in Kenya took the time out to speak to us. I think Laura and I were just completely bowled over by that generosity and that kind of spirit of cooperation. And we were just so incredibly thankful for that because we just had such a privileged insight into what was going on on the ground. It was completely unforgettable. And it really spurred us on in this project to give back for the next few years on this project to really make sure that we can support those local voices who are doing such incredible work on these issues. Yeah, so... If you're interested in some of those civil society organizations in some of that civil society work, we've done a podcast with an organization in Kenya called Hacking a Sharia on a related issue called double registration, which is around ID, which influences people's access to voting. You can find a link in the description along with a link to Hacking a Sharia themselves so you can find out more. Cool. So you're back from Kenya. <laughs> no, you came back, you survived, you've had some sleep. What next? What is it that observers can do? What are the next steps? I think what's been really 
amazing to watch over the past four years is how much things have moved on from when we first started this project. It is clear that election observers understand the challenges of technology and that data protection is important. For example, you know, it's just absolutely the case that this is going to be a major consideration in election observers going forward. And that is wonderful to see. What we have observed ourselves is how much observers are being sucked into the complexities of how technology works. You know, it's like, oh my God, AI, oh my God, deep fakes, oh my God, blockchain. You know, there is all of this whole world of technology that could be applied to elections that is really kind of driving observers crazy about how how do they tackle this. But I think from the work that Laura and I have been doing, there is so much that can be done already and there is so much low-hanging fruit that observers could tackle right now with the tools that they have and the leverage that they have. So really there's this quite sort of cascade of things that we've seen, you know, firstly with the legal framework, this is so important. This is the core of everything. Is there a data protection law? Is there an exemption carved out for political parties? Well, there shouldn't be. So these are kind of really solid recommendations that election observers can make. Then is there a data protection authority? Are they issuing guidance for political parties? Are political parties transparent about who they're working with? Where are they getting their data from? You know, again, these are all completely relevant questions that are absolutely in the election observers' power and knowledge sphere to ask right now. You know, in terms of the voter registration, and the voter register, who has access to this is completely crucial because the voter register, to quote the ICO in the UK, the Information Commissioner's Office, the voter register is the spine on which all other information and profiling is built. So if you start with the voter register, asking questions about that, then everything else can kind of lead out from that. And, I, and it seems to me that it's a great clear way for observers to stamp their mark on this issue without going completely beyond and outside their comfort zone and outside the scope of what of what they do and it's really great to see election observers putting the pressure on social media platforms in terms of the political campaigning issue and building a relationship with social media platforms where they can get access to data that they need because it is very difficult often for civil society to do that you know at pi we've really struggled to kind of get answers that we need from social media companies and it's even more difficult for the users of those platforms to understand what data is collected about them and how it's used so we'd really urge observers that if they have any leverage here to gain more transparency that to please use it and you know really have that collective voice as a community to pressure social media companies to do better and to improve I think a key message for electoral observation missions to take forward in the next few years is that when it comes to privacy and data protection, they really don't need to reinvent the wheel. For every single electoral observation mission that they get into, they already have to become familiar with an incredibly complex and large amount of laws going from political party legislation to electoral management body legislation. And all of that is massive already. Data protection legislation is tiny when compared to all of that. And they definitely have the capacity to work on data protection as well. Lucy, you said about election observers getting kind of sucked into technological specifics and all of the varying buzzwords and new technologies. Do you think that vendors of these technologies, the ways that they're selling them, the ways that they're bigging up their technologies are having an outsized impact on the panic, I guess, that election observers feel about the future? It's a really interesting question because there is no doubt that procurement of anything to do with elections is that there's an awful lot of scrutiny on it and even more so on the procurement of election technology. And there is a lot of focus on the transparency of the decisions and the tenders, and also questions around how this election technology is marketed. You know, how is it kind of put to governments that this election technology will solve all of the perceived problems, or it's an investment that they must make? You know, this perception that being the most technologically advanced election in the world is a goal, it is a bit of a problem in the space, I think. And it, it is something that election observers are having to grapple with. And it's maybe adding, like you say, to this kind of noise around the complexities of technology. 
I mean, looking a bit further down the line, if we think we've got problems with vendors now, wait till something like blockchain voting gets a hold, for example. What is blockchain voting? God. Yeah, it's a thing. <laughs> and again, this is something that is being floated as a way to make elections more secure. You know, I'll just leave it at that. Um, there's a lot of reasons why PI as an organization wouldn't support that. You know, blockchain is kind of proposed as a solution to many different things, not just elections. You know, you say, what about blockchain? We hear this all the time. In the context <laughs> of blockchain voting, the three issues that we have with it is firstly that mining, mining for blockchain takes an awful amount of energy. And, you know, with the energy crisis and the fact that it's being proposed in countries that actually does have quite a limited electricity supply and, you know, the supply is quite intermittent, this would really damage the, you know, the infrastructure of a, of a country if a blockchain voting was put in. I don't know how this would work. Secondly, it really opens up avenues of coercion that I don't think are available right now. So really what a blockchain does well, in, in the context of voting is that a voter would be able to prove A, that they voted and B, how they voted. And if you think about it, coercion, that just opens up these new possibilities that just don't exist. You know, it's not like you're being coerced to vote for a particular party. You get frog marched down to the polling station. There are witnesses to that. You know, it's, that's something that observers could absolutely pick up on. If it's done by the blockchain and someone proving through accessing the blockchain that they voted for this person, that is, there's no visibility to that. You will you will never know how much coercion has gone. And then that opens up more distrust in electoral processes, which we just don't want to see. And the third reason, I think that the reason that blockchain is attractive is because it's perceived as this decentralized system where not one person has ownership over it. But that's not quite what blockchain is now because such an industry has sprung up around it. You know, you have the miners, the platforms that, you know, run the cryptocurrencies, you have the software involved. So actually, it's just a huge industry with a lot more middlemen, which will cause a lot more problems. And, you know, really with the energy crisis, back to this, because I think the energy, the energy thing is really the main thing. Because of the energy crisis, I think we'll find in the future that mining will be concentrated in the hands of a few countries. And that creates a lot of power. There's a lot of power in that. So, you know, this is a very typical thing about introducing a piece of election technology. It's introduced because it will make things more secure and create more trust in the elections. But what it actually does, if there are misunderstandings about how it works, that feeds into distrust in the elections and interested parties will take advantage of that. And that's the problem. That's the problem that we're dealing with. Out of interest, with Ethereum moving to proof of stake rather than proof of work, which is a lot less energy intensive, if blockchain cryptocurrency moves in that direction, becomes less energy intensive and almost fixes itself in that way, are the other problems with it insurmountable? Like the coercion issue is tricky to untangle because a big part of the blockchain is that it exists in lots of different places. It's kind of decentralized though it obviously is not really <laughs> in the way that people imagine it to be are these issues that are theoretically like surmountable or is it just like a fundamentally flawed understanding of why people trust elections well this is part of the problem because blockchain voting is a you know it's a bit future looking it's in its infancy the problems with there are you know as we're discussing it a country might have rolled it out already Oh, and this is what we're seeing all the time is that, you know, a piece of technology which is in its infancy will be rolled out before any of these questions are asked, not even at the point of, oh, here are the problems. Oh, here's how we might overcome them technically. It's already out there and there's no legislation to control it or there's nothing to regulate it and it's off and running. And then once the problems start happening, that's very, very difficult to roll that back. So what we would really like to see is exactly these kind of conversations happening before anything touches the ground. You know, of course, we know technology moves faster than regulation, but things like data protection must be in place first before any of this is rolled out because the problems that it causes are real world problems. You know, I mean, Kenya's had elections annulled and rerun you know, partly off the doubts of how technology was used. The stakes are incredibly high here. So we can, you know, we can get into the weeds about how the technology works or doesn't work or what the solution would be, but that is not the conversation that should be happening. <laughs> cool. 
So there's a lot to clearly think about and digest. What should people look out for? How can people find out more? Well, it would be wonderful if interested people went and looked at our checklist. This is something that we continue to use and we're very keen to get feedback on it because we would like to update it to make it extremely practical for the audience it's intended for, which is observers, but also I think it's useful for civil society and journalists as well. Cool. In which case, we'll put a link in the description to the checklist. It will also be available at pvcy.org forward slash elections checklist. So yeah, so give it a read and then drop us a line if you've got anything you want to say or add about it. Tweet us. You can find us in all the normal places. Mastodon us. Toot us. It's toot us on Mastodon. Yeah. So thank you so much, guys, for your time. Thank you for coming in and, and chatting about this. It's been fascinating. Thank you so much, Caitlin. It's always a pleasure. Thanks for listening. Remember, you can tell us what you think about the podcast by visiting us at pvcy.org forward slash TP survey. You can sign up to be the first to learn more about our work at pvcy.org forward slash pod sign up. And we'll include some links to relevant articles and information in the description wherever you're listening or on our website at pvcy.org forward slash tech bill. Don't forget to rate or subscribe to the podcast on whichever platform you use. Music courtesy of Sepia. Podcast produced by Max Bennell for Privacy International.